Welcome to season two of the Future of Safety Science. This is the series that connects the work of UL research institutes and UL standards and engagement to the next generation of innovators and problem solvers. I'm Kelly Kina, the Director of the Office of Research Experiences and Education, where we are focused on creating the future of safety science through our namesake, education and experience. Today, we get to talk about something I love, failure. With Nicolette Weeks from our Standards and Engagement Organization, we get to see what failure and this thing that I'm wearing, personal flotation devices, have in common. Nicolette Weeks has been with UL Standards and Engagement for the past 14 years. She is a project manager with the Building and Life Safety Technologies Vertical. She is responsible for the Standards Technical Panel, which you may hear referred to as STP, for Personal Flotation Devices, STP 1123, which develops marine safety standards for PFDs, life jackets, and immersion suits. She is also a project manager for several building life safety and security standards, such as fire extinguishers and sprinklers, all such important things. Nicolette graduated from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill with the BA in political science in 2003 and the University of North Carolina, Pembroke with a master's of public administration in 2008. She lives in Durham, North Carolina with her husband, Robert and her son, Hamilton. I am so grateful that you are here and I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Nicolette, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Kelly, for the warm welcome and the introduction. Again, I'm looking forward to discussing the phenomenon of failure within a, a standards development process. UO Standards Technical Panel or UOC Technical Committee, and I'll refer to these back and forth as STP or TC. Um, those, these members are part of the discussion when new proposals are being considered, can influence revisions to the standard, and are aware of new requirements before they are published. It's an opportunity to gain a valuable network of personal contacts as they work with such a diverse group of experts such as manufacturers, retailers, distributors, installation code officials, and others to develop safety standards. A STP or TC member can take pride in knowing that they're giving back and contributing to making a safer world. But failure is always an option during the development of standards. Failure is not a bad thing at times though. I wanna discuss on ways how we try to avoid failure and how it can work to a STP or TC's advantage. Before I get into the phenomenon of failure within a project, I wanted to give an overview of the standards development process. The first step is proposal submission. A proposal request is submitted. It can be submitted by anyone at any time. Next is drafting. This is when standards and revisions are developed. There can also be collaboration amongst industry experts during this phase. After drafting its preliminary review, this step is optional, and this is where it's common and is only done by STP or TC members, and we can also gauge a level of support. Responses to comments are optional during this phase, and we could proceed without changes, proceed with changes, or withdraw the proposal at this point. The default period is 14 days, but can be up to 30 days for more complex proposals. And I'll talk a little bit more about preliminary review a little later. Then we have a ballot and public review. STP members or TC members have opportunity to vote to approve or reject a proposal here. Interested public stakeholders can provide input with comments only. Responses to comments submitted must be provided and consensus must be achieved. Changes to the proposal can only be made based on comments submitted during ballot and public review. And ballot is typically anywhere from 30 days to a, a small proposal to 60 days for a more complex proposal. Next is recirculation. And this only occurs if the ballot and public review has negative votes or comments. STP TC members can reconsider their vote based on responses to the comments and changes to the proposals. And this could last anywhere between 30 to 45 days. And our final step is publication. And this is where we have the publication of the standard with revisions or a brand new standard approved by a consensus body. Next, I will go into how we try to avoid failure during a standards project. 
And here I'm gonna talk about preliminary review again. As a reminder, this is a default process and this is where you submit proposals to, for, to full review prior to sending it to ballot. However, it's within the chair, the STP chair or the technical committee chair's discretion as whether this step may be waived. Input from stakeholders could lead to a withdrawal proposal, development of a task group or modifications to a proposal based on comments received. You've heard me mention consensus a few times. How is it achieved? For ANSI and, and for our Canadian standards, we do need to have approval by at least two thirds of those members voting who submitted a vote, excluding abstentions, negatives without comment and negatives based on material not under consideration. But there is a difference between the two processes. For ANSI or our US standards, a majority of the STP have to return a ballot. For our Canadian side, a majority of the STP has to return an affirmative ballot. So there is a difference between the two processes. We try our best to get full participation from our STP TC members and stakeholders. This will help us obtain our membership and consensus requirements. One way we do that is with email vote reminders. Another way is through individual phone calls, reminding them of the standards activity. As stated earlier, STP TC members are part of the discussion when new proposals are being considered, can influence revisions to the standard and are aware of new requirements before they're published. Participation is very important to the standards development process. Despite the follow-ups throughout the project, it could still fail if consensus is not met. Over the past few years, ULSC has been adopting several ISO standards that cover various personal flotation devices, also known as PFDs. One that was recently adopted and published was UL 12402-4. Work originally started on the standard around 2011. The project restarted around 2017 and went to ballot in 2018 after the task group development proposed requirements. As you can tell, the project got consensus for ANSI, but not for SCC. Due to the negative votes and comments received, we do have an opportunity to move to recirculation. Again, this is where we ballot changes to the proposal and or responses to the comments received. Since the initial ballot did not achieve consensus, but there was a return of the majority of ballots and approval was greater than 50% of those members voting, this is not including abstentions, then comment resolution and recirculation can continue. During this time, a STP or TC member has a right to change their vote based on the reply to the comments or changes to the proposal. It also gives members the opportunity to vote if they did not vote during the original ballot. In the case of UL 1242-4, it was recirculated twice, meaning there were more comments received during the first recirculation. It did gain consensus for both ANSI and SCC, and we were able to publish the standard in 2020. Our process gives our stakeholders the opportunity to try again. If a proposal does not get the necessary votes or comments to proceed, we do encourage the proposal submitted to take the comments received into consideration and resubmit it another time. We do offer the opportunity to form task groups. Sometimes this is an option that may come up during the preliminary review or ballot. The task group has a chair that leads the discussion and members review the proposal in order to provide input on the existing proposal. Most times the task group is successful. Sometimes the proposal may end at the task group level if it's decided that it's not needed. We also offer the opportunity to have a STP meeting in order to discuss a proposal. A STP meeting can be offered after preliminary review or after the ballot in order to have comment resolution for any comments received. This is usually offered for the development of a new standard or for a controversial proposal. Finally, we try to encourage our STP TC members to vote and participate. Their knowledge and expertise is very important to the standards development process. Sometimes failure can lead to a better proposal. As mentioned on the previous slide, having task groups or STP meetings can lead to a positive constructive discussion. The proposal can end up being much stronger and have even safer requirements. More focused attention on a proposal could lead to obtaining majority agreement. Taking comments into consideration promotes collaboration amongst participants and can provide a perspective that a proposal submitted did not originally think of. In conclusion, failure is always an option during the development of standards. 
Failure is not a bad thing because we can use it to our advantage to improve processes or a project. The stakeholder participation is key to the success of a failure or failure of a project. I'd like to thank you all for this time today and I have my contact information on the screen. Again, thank you. Well, thank you for the presentation, Nicolette. I do, I learn so much from you all every time I get to engage with anybody from our standards and engagement uh, organization. And I do have some questions for you okay. uh, based on your presentation and just to know a bit more about you and your background. So I always start by asking, how and why standards for you personally and professionally? How did you come to be in this work and to work for standards and engagement for the last 14 years? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and I kind of laugh because, as you mentioned, my BA is in political science. Um, after graduation, went into education for a few years, used the opportunity to work on my master's degree because political science really doesn't connect too much with standards. Um, but I feel like my master's does is in public administration, so you have public safety, and so the opportunity presented itself, and I applied, and I've been here ever since, so it's just interesting how going for political science kind of led to being in a public safety field, and a fun fact, I did want to go to law school. It didn't quite work out that way, so definitely a shift in what I wanted to do for a career. Yeah, amazing. I love hearing about standards professionals and how you arrive at, at this work. What is some of the most surprising work that you've done? Uh, maybe it was early in your career as in standards or, you know, over the last 14 years. What's some of the most um, surprising or engaging work, I guess, that you've been able to do through standards? And to be honest, not because we're talking about it, I will say PFDs. Um, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> they're an engaging group of people they're hard working and they just make it fun I mean sometimes controversial things do arise during the discussion and development of the standards but I want to say this was probably a highlight I, I got these standards around 2016 mm -hmm. and yeah this this is a good group that they, they work really hard so yeah this was very surprising just to see that level of engagement and passion for some, something that provides safety for all of us Yes, and and I should say that I'm a big fan of the PFD work because I do paddle <laughs> and I'm on the water a lot and I have been doing that for a long time and seeing the evolution of PFDs as they get more fitted for women's bodies in particular. Um, it just it it I think probably in my garage I could showcase the progression of PFDs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I had mine on this morning. Um, so anyway, yeah, no, that that's really interesting. And um, it actually brings me to another question that I have. When we think about the STPs and my obvious enthusiasm for PFDs, um, what, what is a, a criteria for somebody to join an STP? Do they have to have expertise in that standard? Are there places or seats at that table for people without technical expertise? There is. Anybody can apply to join, and we do have a link where people can complete an online application. It is nice for them to have expertise, but we do have an interest category for consumers. It could be somebody like me or you that doesn't have the technical experience, but they have the life experience of using such a product. So anybody can apply and participate. Great. And how about students, you know, I, our audience for this webinar series are students who may or may not be aware of standards and the process of consensus-based standards. Is there a place, um, are there places where they can engage with the STPs if they're really engaged by this conversation? Well, they can also apply. I have not encountered a lot of students, um, in my 14 years, but I have heard from some you're looking for research opportunities or looking for that connection. So sometimes they, I have seen a couple applications where they do apply to try to get those networking um, opportunities. Well, and the, you know, I think it's interesting the the other part that I always think about when I think about consensus-based standards and having all those stakeholder perspectives that are on the science technical panels. Where do you find, is there a place where the consensus is often harder to reach 
or does it just depend on the, the standard that's being formulated? Does that make sense? It does. It makes sense. So as you can see, like the example I showed in my presentation, that group, you know, they, came up, they ran into a lot of different issues. And so it was hard to kind of get people to vote and support what was going on, even though we did have an overwhelming amount of support. There were quite a few people that still had a few issues with the standards. So just trying to encourage that dialogue, whether it's a task group or and have them just kind of look over it again to try to see if there's better ways we can improve it and, and try to get that consensus that we're looking for. So sometimes it's hard and other times we can put a proposal out there, get full consensus and it's not a problem at all. It just depends on the subject matter. Yeah. Are there, um, is there an example? I know you shared with us the, the example that you shared with us, um, but I'm wondering what the conversations sound like when, and obviously not asking for privileged information, mm -hmm. but how, because I think this concept of consensus is very interesting in a, a more general uh, context right now. And mm -hmm. thinking about how anybody reaches consensus right now, especially with a two thirds majority, um, that seems like a, a huge, um, it seems like a lot of the group that does need to reach agreement. What, what are the ways that you all, I guess this is my question, what are the ways that you all help facilitate that to happen when they're when you're in the room and there are disagreements about something as important as what we're talking about, which is people's safety. Yeah. So um, you all standards and engagement, we have to play a neutral role, but we do try to help facilitate meetings. And if they have questions for us, we try to answer, but just try to maybe provide some input to kind of help get that discussion going sometimes because you know things do come up. People have disagreements and we was like, okay, well, we need to kind of decide on something. You know, what do you think about this? Do you think you like requirement A or do you like requirement B? And try to bring that discussion to a close and just see how people feel about it. And sometimes we may have to take a straw poll and try to get people to agree. And usually some people, if they're not okay with it, all right, fine. That's what the majority wants. We'll go with it. So that's usually how we try to get that. We're just facilitating positive discussion. Yeah, amazing. Um, how are, how is the chair for an STP selected? So that person is an employee of UL standards and engagement. So that's how they're picked. Um, I'm not sure if there's a certain criteria as far as like, you know, if they have their degree in that particular field, but they are an employee of ULSC. Amazing. And then, you know, how many standards does UL standards and engagement uh, maintain? We have, and when I say we, ULSC, not just BLST, we have over 1,700 standards. And I thought about another part of that question, too, about the chairs. Sometimes we do have external chairs as well. And that, I think it's also industry-based, but most of the times it is a ULSC employee. I mean, just to stop and think about that, that's the fact that standards and engagement has reached consensus with multiple stakeholders over 1,700 times, <laughs> often multiple times in the iterations, I think is a huge credit to the organization and the process and protocols that you all have in place. It's pretty amazing. It is. Um, so then the standard gets created and then what happens? How does it go from the, the standard to this wonderful thing that I get to own? <laughs> So the standards published at that point, that's whenever the industry, you know, different companies, they, you know, make their product comply to that standard. Let's say it doesn't comply and they come up with a proposal during that period of time, they can just submit it in our collaborative system and we can make changes like that. So our standards can be revised at any time. It's, you know, once it's published, the work doesn't necessarily stop. Okay, amazing. Um, and then tell me about your favorite part of the process. What do you what do you love or where do you find joy or satisfaction in this entire uh, chain of events that you've laid out so wonderfully for us? Well, I think seeing it done, I think seeing it, well, like I said, I have two favorite parts. The actual ballot phase is you have to interact with your stakeholders, try to get them to vote. Um, sometimes they may have problems using our system. They may need to call or send an email. So just trying to build that network and help them at the same time. But of course, ending the project is a favorite 
thing too. You get consensus is moved to publication is done. So it's good to kind of see it happen step by step. So kind of expound on going from the standard to actual use. Uh, our STP members and TC members do have access to those standards and they can take that standard back to their company, take a look at it and, and see if it applies to their standard. And um, I think now we're kind of going into the certification side a little bit, you know, uh, with our clients and stuff and doing the testing and making sure that it works for their product. That's great. And, and if I understand correctly, these are voluntary standards. And so there's not regulation involved in the standards that we're creating. Correct. Right. And that, I mean, if you could speak to that for just a moment, um, you know, I, I think that that was a big realization or aha moment for me when I first joined the organization to think that there are over 1700 standards where we're asking we're, we're putting out the work and saying this is um, the standard that is set for safety around this particular system or product. Mm -hmm. And then we're saying to people, it's voluntary to take this standard and use it. Is that, is that an appropriate um, like synopsis of that? Yeah, I think that's appropriate because um, we're not forcing anybody to use our standard. So um, I think it is more of a voluntary thing. It's, yeah, it's um, it's pretty interesting and, and pretty fantastic to think about. Um, and as Nicolette said, when we go into, or as you said, when we go into the testing and certification side of things, it's really a handoff from our standards organization to another part of our enterprise, which is UL Solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Cool. Um, all right. Well, I found this quote as we were getting ready for our conversation today, and it's by a woman, uh, Emily McDowell, and it just says, remember that there is no such thing as failure. There's only learning. Sometimes you will end up learning what doesn't work, and sometimes what seems like a terrible failure will turn out to be the best thing that ever happened. And I think this is, you know, we think of this term failure as such a negative thing, but, uh, you know, as you showed us, it can actually end up being a learning opportunity, especially when we're talking about so many people who participate in this process. Awesome. All right. Well, that is another episode in our Future of Safety Science series. We are so excited that we're back this year, and these recordings will be um, available for you all, and they will be available on ul.org and on our YouTube channel. So join us there and join us for the discussion. And um, thank you for being here. And Nicolette, thank you for being here. And thank you for the work that you do. We're very grateful. Thank you, Kelly. I enjoyed it.